What's up everybody, I'm Jason and welcome back to another video of tips and tricks for the Canon EOS R5. In this video is the first part of a three-part mini-series focusing on various functions in the Canon R5 that you can use to get more dynamic range out of your images. Now the good news here is that this isn't 2012 anymore. Canon's cameras are no longer the worst in the industry when it comes to dynamic range. And in fact, their performance is quite good, class-leading in some cases. However, there are situations where any camera just doesn't capture enough dynamic range, or the files just can't store enough dynamic range to cover the range of the scene. This is especially true if you're shooting in JPEG mode. In this video, I'm going to talk about two options mostly for non-RAW shooters, specifically HDRPQ and HDR mode. In the next video, I'll look at auto exposure bracketing, and in the final video, I'm going to talk about a novel trick that you can do with dual pixel RAW files to get some more dynamic range. First off, we'll, let's talk about the new HDRPQ feature. You'll find this on the Shoot 2 menu under the entry HDRPQ settings. Now, HDRPQ stands for High Dynamic Range Perceptual Quantization, and enabling HDRPQ doesn't technically expand the dynamic range that the camera captures, but it does expand the range that can be saved compared to a JPEG. When HDRPQ is enabled, the R5 will use the new High Efficiency Image File, or HEIF, format instead of saving to JPEGs. HEIF files offer two major benefits, better compression and higher bit depth. In short, compared to a JPEG, HEIF files will give you higher image quality for the same file size or smaller files for the same image quality. Additionally, on the R5, when HDRPQ is enabled, images are saved using the REC 2020 color primaries which gives an even wider color gamut than Adobe RGB can for JPEGs. In general, thanks to the REC 2020 primaries the high and the higher bit depths, HDRPQ files should be much closer to the quality of a RAW file than a JPEG can be. Technical details aside, there are some practical limitations when enabling HDRPQ on the R5. Notably, when it's enabled, you cannot use expanded ISOs, so ISOs 50 and 102,500, multiple exposures, HDR mode, or focus bracketing. Additionally, you cannot change the color space to Adobe RGB or sRGB, and finally, the viewfinder will be locked to smooth instead of power savings. Additionally, if you have the real-time histogram enabled, you'll notice that the right quarter to two-fifths of it is grayed out. According to Canon, these values correspond to signal levels that aren't used in the HDRPQ files. Though, for me, it's not at all apparent to me what Canon is actually trying to convey with this histogram either. There are two other options in the HDRPQ menu. These are HDR Assist Display Shooting and Playback. And these control how the camera displays the images when shooting and reviewing, respectively. For both of these options, you can choose to have the camera focus on either accurately rendering highlights or midtones. While the HDRPQ settings can be used when shooting RAW, there appears to be and there appears to be some technical differences in the files that are generated, I can't find any practical value in doing this. There is ob no obvious increase in dynamic range compared to a standard RAW file, and in fact, the only practical difference that I can see is that the default tone curve that's applied in Canon's Digital Photo Professional software is different. However, for those of us that use third-party RAW processors, such as Adobe's Lightroom, the results appear virtually identical to the standard RAW files. Altogether, there's certainly some benefits in shooting in HDRPQ mode, at least if you're a JPEG user and you need to get more, uh, more dynamic range or a wider color gamut and you can't switch to shoot in RAW. However, as far as I can tell, HDRPQ images are limited to the same dynamic range as a RAW file at the same ISO. 
That said, I don't really see a point in shooting HDR PQs. Now, this might be because I shoot RAW, and so I'm already working with the maximum dynamic range and color gamut that the camera can capture anyway. Or it might just be because I'm missing something, but, you know, at least as a RAW user, it seems like there's a lot of compromises for no real gain. Now, if you're a JPEG shooter, then the story is obviously going to be a bit different. Moving on from HDRPQ, we step up to what I consider the first real range expanding option on the camera, HDR mode. You'll find this on the Shoot 5 member or Shoot 5 menu under the aptly titled HDR mode entry. This is a traditional multi-shot HDR process where the camera shoots 3 frames at different exposures and then aligns and stacks them to create a single HDR image. In-camera HDRs are always saved as JPEG files, though you do have the option to save the source images if you want to be able to reprocess them later. Unfortunately, while this would be a great place to use the wider dynamic range available in HEIF, that's not an option. To enable HDR mode, you'll need to set the dynamic range under the Adjust Dynamic Range setting. By default, this will be set to Disable HDR. The other four options are auto, plus or minus one EV, plus or minus two EV, and plus or minus three EV. When set to auto, the camera will attempt to evaluate the tonal range of the scene and select a bracket size that best covers the scene's range. The other three options allow you to manually specify the range that you want the camera to use. Now remember, larger ranges will of course capture more shadow and highlight detail, However, since the resulting dynamic range ultimately has to be compressed into the range that can be saved in a JPEG file, the larger the range used, the more compressed it will ultimately be. The next setting is the effect setting. This controls how source images are blended together to create the final image. Since the end result is a JPEG with a limited dynamic range, the blending algorithm has to determine how to fit that potentially much wider range that's captured into the dynamic range that can be stored in a JPEG. Possible effects are natural, art standard, art vivid, art bold, and art embossed. Natural attempts to produce, or natural produces an image that attempts to remain true to the scene while preventing clipping and highlights with, uh, or, and increasing shadow detail. The art modes attempt to make the HDR more artsy or intense, it's similar to what most of us would immediately recognize as that classic kind of HDR look. The art modes will also interact with the currently set picture style though you'll have to experiment with this behavior as it isn't clearly documented in the manual. The next setting is Continuous HDR, and this setting controls whether the camera will continue to shoot HDR images or if it will turn the HDR mode off after one HDR set is completed. Personally, I'd recommend keeping this at one shot unless you know that you're going to shoot a lot of HDRs in one setting. For me, what I've found is that if you leave this to continuous, what can happen is you shoot a bunch of HDRs, you forget about it, you put the camera away, and then the next time you grab the camera and you're going to go shoot something, all of a sudden, you know, you've got the camera shooting HDRs and that's not necessarily what you wanted. Next up is Auto Image Align, which can either be set to enable or disable. As the name implies, this controls whether the camera attempts to align the three source images before blending them. Canon's recommendation is to enable this when shooting handheld and to disable this when shooting from a tripod. I would suggest possibly also looking at using the, or enabling this if you're shooting with image stabilization on from a tripod, that's something you'll want to play with. That said, there are a number of caveats with enabling this feature that may cause the, it, uh, the feature to fail. Uh, these include overly bright and dark frames that it can't align, repeating patterns that get aligned improperly, and too much of a misalignment where the camera just can't align it anyway. As always, when shooting images with complex processing being done either in camera or in post, 
I always recommend that you verify the results that you are getting in the field before you move on to your next shot. Finally, you have the option to save either all of the frames that were captured or just the final HDR. If you save all of the frames, then the three source frames will also be saved in the format that the non-HDR images you're typically shooting or you would have been shooting were saved in. So for example, if you're shooting in RAW, those frames will be saved as RAW files. If you're shooting in small JPEG, they'll be saved as small JPEGs. The final HDR image is always saved as a JPEG. If you're shooting in JPEG mode, the HDR JPEG will be sized to ma and match the size and quality of those files. If you're shooting in RAW or RAW plus JPEG, then the rendered file will always be saved as a large fine quality file. So that wraps, wraps up the first part of this mini series looking at things that can be done to expand the dynamic range in your images. In the next part, as I said, I'm going to look at auto exposure bracketing and the options that affect it. This is, of course, the old school way to shoot HDR sets that you will stack in post-production. However, I won't be covering the stacking part in that video. If you found this video useful, please consider smashing that like button. Also, please consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.